The China in Africa podcast is brought to you in partnership with the Africa China Reporting Project at Wits University in Johannesburg. The ACRP aims to improve the quality of reporting on Africa China relations through reporting grants, workshops, and other opportunities for journalists. More information at africachinareporting.co.za and our dedicated training website at africachinatraining.com. Hello and welcome to another edition of the China in Africa podcast, a proud member of the Seneca Network from SubChina. I'm Eric Olander, and as always, I'm joined by Kobus van Staden, the senior China-Africa researcher at the South African Institute of International Affairs in Johannesburg, South Africa. A very good morning to you, Kobus. Good morning. Kobus, today we're going to be talking about China and the Caribbean. This has been part of our look at what China's doing in other parts of the world that we've been doing for the past year. Chinese engagement in the Caribbean is very interesting. It's not a subject that a lot of people know about. Uh, there are 19 members of the Belt and Road Initiative in the Caribbean. Lots of infrastructures going on there. Huawei has a presence there. But as you can imagine, Cobus, because of all that presence so close to the United States, it certainly caught the attention of Washington. And for that reason, it's very interesting for us to take a look at what the Chinese are doing there. Yeah, it's really interesting. There's a lot of parallels with Africa. Like, you know, the Caribbean exports similar things to Africa. It has similar needs to Africa, including infrastructure. But the big difference is that it sits right in the U.S.'s backyard. So it, 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 it all, all of the, all of the kind of growing tensions between the United, the United States and China actually are in play here. Kobus, one of the difficulties at looking at what the Chinese are doing in the Caribbean is that there really isn't a lot of information available out there, but there is an excellent podcast, China in the Caribbean podcast, hosted by Rashid Griffith. This is a show that started last year, and he's been looking at all the different facets of what the Chinese are doing in the Caribbean, much the same way that you and I have been doing with the China and Africa podcast. Unfortunately, though, Kobus, you weren't able to join us yesterday in the discussion. We held out as long as we could, uh, but you didn't have any power. Yes, like if, when you talk about about infrastructure provision in the global south, this is what we're talking about. I had no power, so I couldn't join the podcast. Yeah, it happens from time to time, but the show must go on. So here's my conversation with Rashid Griffith from Barbados. Rashid Griffith, a very good morning to you from Bridgetown. Hi, Eric. It's great to have you on the program finally after all these months. Again, I've been a big follower and big fan of the China in the Caribbean podcast. I also read an article that you wrote last December in The Diplomat, and you said that uh, the Caribbean was the first region to experience what have become the main critiques of the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, and they are the lack of transparency, white elephant projects, ignored environmental concerns, investments long on promises, and short on results. So with that in mind, let's start our discussion with an overview of where we are in the China-Caribbean relationship today. Sure. So I think one of the complications of discussing China-Caribbean is actually to figure out where the Caribbean is, because the actual contour of the Caribbean is quite complicated. We have the English Caribbean, which people mostly know, you know, Barbados, Grenada, Jamaica, and so on. But then you have the French Caribbean, which is still actually part of France. You have the Dutch Caribbean, still part of the Netherlands. And also you have these, say, coastal regions of South America and Central America, like Belize to Guyana. So it's a very, very expansive geopolitical space. And because of that, the way how China interacts with the Caribbean, it, it's, you know, changes quite a lot. So, for example, you have these very large infra projects in Jamaica. You have the North South Highway, which is a fairly famous one. That what you would call, say, a more of a success in some cases. This was started by France and other European countries back in the nineteen nineties. That was never completed for different costs and funding problems. Then China stepped in to complete it. But one of the things that you find. Interesting in this project is that as payment, Jamaica actually transferred twelve hundred acres of land to the Chinese firm instead of actually doing hard cash transfers. It's a very unique way of actually doing the payment. And then you have, for example, in Guyana, I think I mentioned in the article that you have these very awkward projects like the. The airport has still never completed after ten years, but you see, I think what the indication is. You see, for example, the difference not in the Chinese company per se, but you see a difference in the government oversight. 
where in Jamaica was much more closely monitored. But in Guyana, because of the capacity constraints in the country, you have these projects that kind of go awry because, it, you know, in reality, the Chinese firms don't actually have that much commitment domestically in, in the country, which is, which is a, a critique you hear about over time. I know that there is like a big issue with the whole debt trap diplomacy narrative. I, I don't think it's actually a very useful narrative because in reality, the governments themselves in the, in the Caribbean, and this is where I kind of get this um, counterpoint from, the difference is that when the governments actually have a much more involvement, when they have a much more utility in the projects being fulfilled, and not just allowing the company to kind of go or go and build as they please, you see a much better completion rates, much better compliance, much better resource utilization. So I think that the big issue with the Caribbean that kind of should have been seen in the world is that when the government doesn't have enough capacity to kind of oversee and actually monitor projects, you can get these really bad white elephant concerns, which I think are primarily a fault of the government and not a fault of the actual company itself. What's the appeal and the attraction of the Caribbean to China. It's a relatively small market. It's a population of 44 million people, so not a big domestic market in that regional space. It's a very fragmented market with lots of different countries, lots of different regulatory bodies and whatnot. What do you think is the appeal for the Chinese to engage in the Caribbean? Is it geopolitical? Is it for contracts for Belt and Road companies? Or is it just to basically put themselves in the backyard of the United States and really try to kind of get under, the, you know, their skin? Well, it, it, it depends because on the Chinese company side, yes, it is a matter of contractual agreements. So the Caribbean has a very large deficit when it comes to infrastructure. This is a known problem for, you know, many decades. And there is no way to actually fill that gap. You have the Chinese firms that they have to grow because they need more contracts. And then they have to look out into the world to get these new projects. And the Caribbean has many potential projects to build. Granted, not many are actually as large as we'll find in Africa or Latin America or Southeast Asia, but there are quite a lot. So on the one side, that is a, a path for Chinese firms to kind of actually get more contracting work done. On the side of the political or geopolitical side, there is this argument that China wants to have a foothold in the Caribbean as a beachhead market into Latin America or into North America. And there is a lot of truth to that, I think, because you see not only a lot of engagement in, from China in terms of infrastructure, but also in terms of the financial markets or legal markets, which is actually giving me a bigger actually a bigger engagement. So, for example, all of the large Chinese firms that are listed in the in the U.S. stock market. They're all based in Cayman Islands, for example, because of the legal arrangements there. Um, there are many uh, there are many Chinese companies that are actually based on the stock market in Curacao, Dutch Caribbean. So you have these different engagement points, and now you're seeing a lot of more engagement in terms of the shipping routes, where. So Chinese firms are building um, ports in Jamaica, they're doing ports in Suriname, they want to do some ports in Barbados and Trinidad as well. All of this is actually a way to kind of have a non-American-centric shipping lanes to get into these key markets for them to sell goods. So it's a lot of different reasons why the, um, China or Chinese interests see the Caribbean as a very attractive market, even though it's a small small size of the islands and market size, it allows a lot of access to the where the bigger markets are. But you've used the kind of terms Latin America and Caribbean almost interchangeably. And in the vernacular, oftentimes it's listed as LAC, Latin America, Caribbean here. And I think it's important for people to appreciate. And sometimes when we talk about this in the China-Africa context, it's overlooked that South America or the Americas, maybe the LAC zone, uh, does a third more trade every year with China than does Africa. And that's a that's a little point of fact that I think a lot of people miss, in part because of the enormous growth in agricultural trade with Argentina, w with Brazil, and with others. But then I think here the Caribbean does play a role, as you talked about, in terms of those shipping lanes and obviously the financial aspect of it. You didn't also mention that in the Cayman Islands, a lot of wealthy Chinese Put their money there. And we saw that through the Panama Papers a couple years ago when it was revealed that quite a few 
uh, Chinese are, were, were, were laundering or putting their money through and hiding their money uh, in this parts of the world is there. So on the subject of money, on the subject of the infrastructure that you talked about, what is the debt situation in the Caribbean, particularly in countries like your own in Barbados? It, it, do we have a debt situation like we have in Africa where a small number of countries have assumed enormous amounts of Chinese debt and are finding it difficult to pay back? Or is it more measured and more balanced? I think off the bat, I should say some Caribbean countries do have very high debt, but none is to, none of the actual problem is to China, mostly to the IMF or the World Bank or the European Union. Um, China has actually not given that many loans t- to the Caribbean countries. So it's, it's, this, it's kind of a weird thing where you kind of think the loan issue is a Chinese issue. It's not. Um, in some metrics, I think you should ask the question, why hasn't China given more loans to the Caribbean? To me, that's, to me, that's actually a bit more uh, in- interesting. Uh, we, we still don't know. One, one big issue could be that the, the, there's actually just not that many attractive large-scale projects that, that they want to build. So the, the debt in the Caribbean is fairly heterogeneous. You have some countries like Jamaica that has a lot more debt, as if over the last 10 years had very, well, not mean the last 30 years, had some very serious debt problems. But again, most of the debt's from the IMF and their own domestic debt. Guyana, for example, has fairly high debt as well. Barbados actually defaulted on debt last year or year before. But again, that debt is primarily from overseas lenders in the US and EU and then domestic debt. So Chinese debt doesn't actually play a big role in the Caribbean. Do they want Chinese debt or they just have an approach the Chinese for this kind of financing? It's hard to say because it, it, it's the, in the cases where China uh, or these Chinese companies have done large projects in, in the Caribbean, it's been on some of these alternative prop, the alternative payment schemes. Like I mentioned Jamaica. In Jamaica, they, they wanted these new projects done, but they didn't want to take on any more debt because the IMF program, that's the International Monetary Fund, structural adjustment program they're under, they can't actually take on that much debt because that would actually make their, um, they would actually lose, lose the, the, the metrics that they need to keep the IMF program going. So that's why, for example, China was able to build a North South Highway because they were able to do it and actually get paid in this land land uh, alternative sales, actual cash. It's actually very rare for China to do in terms of land payment, but it's actually very common for China to do in domestically, where in, on the domestic side, these um, policy banks do actually use land collateralized loans in China, but outside of China, the Jamaica example is actually quite rare. But I think it was done because they're much more flexible in terms of how the actual payments are supposed to be made back in, in, in the Caribbean. I think the problem is that in the, many Caribbean countries, they are very wary of taking on debt because they've had this many, many decades of experience with actually doing defaulting and IMF programs, where I think in many other countries, the actual experience of the IMF being like a, boogie, a boogeyman is not as, as, as strong. So I think just because of that reason, it's, it's a very unlikely chance that China could even offer a lot of debt to the Caribbean. At the beginning of the program, I mentioned that 19 countries in the Latin America Caribbean zone are members of the Belt and Road Initiative. That's a rather sizable number of countries. But it's very interesting because I met a couple years ago with an ambassador in Beijing from the Caribbean, and he brought up this very fascinating question to me. He said, a lot of the countries in the Caribbean don't know what to do with the BRI. So as you've pointed out, they're not going to take on large infrastructure debt. And we had this wonderful conversation about what should countries like Jamaica, Barbados, St. Kitts, all of these smaller countries that are members of the BRI, what should they do to take advantage of it? And it really brings up the other issue of do these countries have a clear vision as to how they want to engage China? So let's talk about the Belt and Road Initiative and whether or not there's any utility to it because debt is not a part of it. Big infrastructure is not a part of it. So then what is it? And do countries have a China strategy? The Caribbean countries do not have a China strategy. I I always joke that you can't even have a China strategy if you don't have a U.S. strategy, which they also do not have. 
And that's a indictment, I think, on the capacity of the government to actually have. How is it possible they don't have a U.S. strategy? I mean, really? I mean, how is it possible <laughs> that the United States has been messing in their business for for centuries mm. and they still don't have a U.S. policy? Really? That's correct. That, really? Yeah. It, 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 it is shocking, but it's also true. Wow. So there is a big... It, I always tell people that... It, I mostly have this chat with U.S. people. It's a very common saying in the U.S. Personnel is policy. But for some reason, you don't apply that same logic to other countries. So in the Caribbean, the personnel in charge of these foreign engagements are of these commerce, are these technology centers. They, there's no, they don't have no actual capacity to kind of understand how these things should be set up. And I always try to, to remind people that the public service in the Caribbean has been historically quite lackluster. So it should not be that much of a shock that there's no U.S. policy, so there's no EU policy in the Caribbean either. Wow. And so China is even farther down the list then. If there's no U.S., no EU. So China so, is even, that's correct. So, and this is a problem in some African countries as well, and not just in Africa, but in a number of different countries where they don't have a China policy, but China definitely has a policy about their country. It used to be that in Africa, there used to be a pan-African policy, that there were a bunch of guys in the Chinese foreign ministry in Beijing who were tasked to cover Africa. And then over the years now, there's a Nigeria desk, there's a South Africa desk, they've got diplomats who've done 20 years of tours there in multiple countries. And they really have a sophistication now down to the national level. And even within the national level in countries like Nigeria, there are oftentimes experts in Northern and Southern. I mean, they really have dialed this in, in a quite sophisticated way. Uh, whereas a lot of African countries still struggle to have, as you point out in the Caribbean, equal amounts of sophistication towards the Chinese. And when they sit down at talks, they don't know what they want. They don't know how to get the most out of the relationship with China. And now that they're being jostled back and forth between the US and China, it makes it even more competitive. So I guess what needs to be done in order to get people to focus on China if in fact they want to try and leverage this relationship? So I, I should say, well, let's give a, a, a clear example here. One of my favorite examples to use is this. In 2003 or four, when the PRC had built a stadium in Grenada. At the opening ceremony, the band, the police band, played the anthem for Taiwan. It, 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 is, it is that start. That's, that's, that is, you know, years ago. But then, compared to now, there was a, there was a, a ceremony in St. Kitts uh, maybe last year where Taiwan had donated some supplies to St. Kitts. And then the speaker, who was a, a high-ranking government official, said, thank you to the people of China for this good donation. So even now... Nothing much has changed in the last couple of decades in terms of knowledge of what the PRC is, what the ROC is. There is very little understanding of what these things actually mean. And this is actually, again, comes back to the whole problem of there's no capacity in the actual government's public sector to kind of even start this conversation. I don't think this is going to change anytime soon. I think what's going to actually happen is that it's going to have a much more haphazard, ad hoc approach to how these things are done. So what I could say, as you mentioned with the, the, on, the, on the Chinese side, so usually when I speak to people from the ministry, from the embassies of China and the Caribbean, relative to people from the embassy of the U.S. and Caribbean, the Chinese people actually have a much better understanding of what the Caribbean needs and what the Caribbean is like and what their problems are. Honestly, to me, still very surprising, given, again, given the U.S. has been here a lot longer. Let's get very granular here. There's a small island, and I had to look this up, called Dominica. Dominica. And... Dominica. Okay. <laughs> I, you know, and I originally thought that it was the Dominican Republic. Mm. I'd never heard of Dominica. And then I looked it up and it was 75,000 people on the island mm -hmm. of Dominica. <laughs> and yet just a couple of weeks ago, Chinese president Xi Jinping had a call with the president. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Why is president Xi taking time out of his schedule to have a call with a country in the Caribbean that just has 75,000 people? That's, that's a good question. I think some bit, some wider context might actually be very useful here. So in 2013, President Xi came to the Caribbean for the first time. This is in uh, Trinidad. as the very first time any Chinese president came to the Caribbean, of course. 
Contrast that, however, with the U.S., where it's only two times that a, a U.S. president has come to Caribbean, Reagan and Obama. And then Obama came because of the OAS conference, and then Reagan came after the uh, Jamaican, sorry, the Grenadian in, uh, invasion of, from the U.S. to kind of actually start the whole CBI process over again. So China actually has been a lot more diplomatically engaged relative to, relative to anywhere else in the Caribbean compared to even European countries. And even on that same trip in 2013, it was the beginning of the actual America's journey for, for China, and they started with the Caribbean. And then even on that trip, and you look at the people on the plane, it was also it was also Wang Huning, it was also uh, Wang Yi. All the top brass of China just came to pay a visit to the Caribbean leaders and the president of the different Caribbean countries. It's a very, very shocking thing to think of. So in reality, you hear this, you hear this, let's say, I won't call it propaganda at this point, where China treats everyone equally. But in reality, they actually do that in the Caribbean quite a lot. And when you see, for example, how the Caribbean ministers respond to China, even the prime ministers and so on, they are a lot more receptive of the diplomatic engagement because they feel that the U.S. actually treats them with, just, uh, with no respect. And you hear it all the time, over and over, from ambassadors, from prime ministers in, in the Caribbean. There's one example I also bring up where there was a, a recounting from a farmer Caribbean, a, a farmer Chinese ambassador to the Bahamas, where the Bahamas prime minister was talking about how he always feels very slighted when the U.S. has the diplomatic call because they never send a person of high rank, always send the, you know, an ambassador, which is not very high ranking compared to a prime minister. But he always says in, on the Chinese side, they always treat his office with more respect. So that's actually a thing you see over and over in the Caribbean where China really pushes the diplomatic game quite strong. Um, compared to other Caribbean, compared to other Western countries, and also another example in the OECS is the a subgrouping of Caribbean states, like a, almost like a mini EU in some sense. They, the China actually applied to be a member of <laughs> a observer member of the OECS, and China also is actually a, a a member of the Caribbean Development Bank. The U.S. is not, by the way. So this diplomatic engagement strategy that China's been playing in the Caribbean is decades old, and it's actually quite much, you could say it's actually working quite a lot. And that's very similar to what goes on in Africa, too, where the that's Chinese right. get quite yeah. a bit of credit for just showing up. And it's mm-hmm. one of the appeals that people in Washington are making to Biden now is you got to just show up. And But just putting a country like Dominica on the call sheet for a 10-minute phone call for the president, to me, is something that's rather remarkable. Let me run a theory by you as to why I think President Xi had that phone call with Dominica. And by the way, it was just announced this week that the Chinese are allocating 20,000 doses of their donation to COVAX, uh, which is the Global Vaccine Alliance, to Dominica. So Dominica will be uh, receiving uh, vaccines directly from China as part of the COVAX Alliance, but they really touted it up that it came from China, which I thought was very interesting because normally it would go through COVAX and they would say, this is a COVAX donation, but this was a COVAX donation from China. Very interesting there. Okay, here's why I think President Xi gave attention to Dominica is because Dominica may be a small country, in fact, probably one of the world's smallest countries at 75,000. That's probably just a neighborhood of mine here in Ho Chi Minh City. But it still is a vote at the United Nations, right? Mm -hmm. That's right. It's still a vote at all of the international organizations that the Chinese try to lobby and try to rally on their side. And so I think that they're making that investment for those UN votes. And that is what's important to China as much as anything else. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's very true. So yeah, the, the, there's no, I think there's no ifs or buts about it. China does want to get more influence to kind of have more sway and multilateral approach to how these things are done. And you see, it, you see it kind of mentioned almost explicitly in some sense where there are some government officials in China that have already said, yes, we, let's like, probably use Zhu Rong, from the, I think, China Cam International Trade Corporation, he, he said that China sees bilateral as the foundational aspect of, of doing relationships, but multilateralism is how you get influence. 
in in the system so when they approach the caribbean they also have this whole bilateral thing as well but they also do it to also build this multilateral coalition to help china get certain things done and again you see across the caribbean they're very and they they're very i guess skilled and actually showing up to actually show hey we actually support you so therefore help support us Support for this podcast comes from the Africa-China Reporting Project at the Wits University Journalism Department in Johannesburg. The ACRP provides reporting grants, workshops, and other professional development opportunities for journalists. Follow the ACRP on Twitter at Wits China Africa or visit africachinareporting.co.za. Earlier, you brought up the question of Taiwan, and I think that's what makes the Caribbean and the, the Latin America region more broadly very interesting and very different than other parts of the world. Because out of the 14 or 15 countries, I can't keep track how many it is, because again, it changed, and we're going to get to it changed very briefly, that number. <laughs> uh, but out of the 14 or 15 countries that still recognize Taiwan diplomatically, nine are in the Latin America. Caribbean region. Some very familiar names here, Guatemala, Honduras, Haiti, Nicaragua, Belize, St. Vincent and the Grenadines, St. Kitts, St. Lucia. So these are, you know, Taiwan is an issue, unlike in any other part of the world. Why does this still matter in the Caribbean to recognize Taiwan compared to, say, shifting that recognition like they've done in Africa and other parts of the world to China. In Africa today, only Eswatini is the last holdout that still recognizes Taiwan. But why is the Taiwan issue still very relevant in the Caribbean? I think the bottom line is clout. I think that's the reason. Because clout or cash? I think clout, actually. Really? Yes. So if you look at the numbers of what Taiwan gives to these, I say, Caribbean countries, it's, it's very small. It's very, very small. It is so small that you cannot argue it is numbers when it comes to the, the engagement. However, what Taiwan does give to these small countries is when you have these diplomatic exchanges in Taiwan from Caribbean, they are like kings in some sense. They have this much higher affinity in the diplomatic um, uh, section of, of, of Taiwan than it would ever have in, in China. And you see that play out for the regular paper written on the Paraguay-Taiwan relationship where on elite politics side, the elite politics and the elite politicians, sorry, in Paraguay, for example, are extremely close to the power brokers in Taiwan. And you see a similar thing in the Francois St. Vincent. You see a similar thing there as well. So I think it's actually more of a clout question than a matter of cash. Because there's no way, no way that Taiwan can outcash, <laughs> outspend um, China in the Caribbean. But I think a bigger point that I think is often missed in this point. I mentioned that China doesn't actually have that much investment in the Caribbean. So, for example, Barbados has a very long-term call it ally if you want, I wouldn't use the word, but call it ally of China, hasn't had that much big projects from China. See, the Caribbean benefits from China is all the same in one way, is the import cost reduction. That is, the cost savings that the Caribbean gets from importing goods from China is equal across the board because the money, because China does these things much cheaper, the money you save on the imports, you can, you know, respend in other other areas. That does not change if you recognize China or not. Same thing, same, but the same goods that Barbados buys. So they don't actually have the big need to kind of, you know, do the whole switch because it's not that much of a cash you're giving up, given there are actually not that many big projects or loans in the first place, which goes back to what I mentioned earlier about the IMF and so on and so on. So I actually think that the reason is very much the elite politics um, sticking point and not a very big economic sticking point. That's interesting you say that because the Chinese in Africa have been very, very good at elite capture. They've been very good at building and fostering relationships with elites there and the governing elites to make sure that they feel warm and fuzzy. And so I thought that they would be well-versed in that in a place like the Caribbean. But as you said, Taiwan must have something there. Okay, That's let's right. now talk about Guyana. 
what mm-hmm. happened in Guyana? I mean, it is absolutely hysterical. First, tell us where Guyana is, and then tell us what happened. So Guyana, Guyana. is on. <laughs> it's technically on South America. It's on the Southern American continent, but it goes in the coastal region of it, which is actually the only part that actually has people. The it's actually a mostly very empty country. It's the country land mass is bigger than England, but it only has about seven hundred thousand people. <laughs> so that's what it is. It's part of the Caricom region, which is the Caricom is like the Caribbean community. It's like a almost like an ASEAN type arrangement in the Caribbean. So what happened there was. <laughs> Guyana had signed a deal with Taiwan for t- to have a Taiwan office opened in Guyana, primarily to do investment and trade, so they said. But then one day after the deal was announced publicly by the U.S. and also by um, Tang Yuen on Taiwan social media, Guyana canceled it. Out the blue. And it was not even a day. It was less than 24 hours than 24 that it hours. flipped. I mean, it was the fastest diplomatic recognition or trade or representative office announcement that you've ever seen. Yes. Less than 24 hours. Yes. Incredible. So Why? It, what happened? Yeah. So it appears that the on, the on the Guyana side, there was a lot of weird dealing. So what it was reported, I guess what I found out, I suppose, is... The deal was apparently done unilaterally and didn't have any cabinet approval. And it is, and this is kind of not that surprising given the, again, the government is, is a very new government in Guyana. They only came to power, I think, in August, I think, last year. And it, they're trying to figure things out. And they're trying to really kind of, you know, almost stick to the man in some sense to kind of doing things that the last government could not have done and so on. Pride, pride gets in the way. So someone from the government there apparently signed a deal with Taiwan without actually having an approving cabinet. And then when it came out, it was a huge domestic backlash. So it was not only internationally, it was in, in, in Guyana. A lot of Guyanese people were like, why would you do that? Why would you try to, you know, in their case, risk the China, the China bond that apparently we have? And the opposition party in Guyana also had a huge rampage about the the engagement as well, and they eventually got to a point where the president himself canceled it. All within twenty four hours. Right? All those, I mean, this all was so hours. fast. Where we so got fast. the announcement yeah. that they were going to open the representative office, and the U.S. and Tsai Ing Wen kind of put their tweets out, and then we thought, oh, okay, and then lo and behold. You wake up the next day and it's all been flipped and switched. That's and it right. was really quite remarkable. With that in mind, how stable do you think the current Taiwan relationships are with those nine states? And do you think that they're they're vulnerable to being flipped? Hmm. I would say the relationship of Taiwan, at least in, for example, like St. Vincent, St. Lucia, Paraguay, I think are fairly stable. The thing about it is that it's very hard to figure out how they could be flipped. Because even in the examples recently, with, for example, when the DR or Panama, when they flipped, you can see a lot of it was actually done on the elite politics level. It was not done really in a very big economic consideration. I think when you see, for example, how the people discuss it, it was more of a done, again, I think it's really a clout type question. So if there is some falling out between elite politics in, for example, St. Kitts or St. Vincent or St. Lucia and Taiwan, I think that would accord the flipping of the, to the PRC. Because even in St. Lucia, but St. Lucia is an interesting case because St. Lucia actually flipped before. I think people don't realize that. So it was first, it was Taipei, then it was Beijing, and then it's back to Taipei I think 97 or so, or maybe 2000. So it actually did flip, and I flipped back. <laughs> um, and that was a matter of elite politics. So I think elite politics drive more, especially small countries, more of the actual flipping than actually some large economic plan. One of the things that we see in Africa is there's a huge gap between how elites look at China and see China, which is generally quite favorably, enthusiastically, And yet in civil society, the guy on the street oftentimes has a much more complex view, many cases downright negative. 
What is the view on the street? And again, I know there's, that's a very simplistic, reductionist way of looking at it. But generally speaking, public opinion towards the Chinese in the Caribbean, how would you describe it? So, of course, because the Caribbean is very, very diverse, it changes per country. But I would say on average, at least in the English-speaking Caribbean, on average, I think most people on the streets have zero opinion on China. They cannot name Beijing, for example. They cannot name where it, probably where it is on a map. Um, I know for a fact. So there's very little opinion. Only recently, because of the virus, there is some opinion on China. Obviously, you know, Wuhan, is, they, they know that name now. But before 2020, I would say there's generally no understanding of China in the Caribbean. You know, again, on average, a very large, you know, swath argument here. But the elite politics in, in, in the Caribbean is also, like I mentioned earlier, is also pretty ambivalent to China as well. Because it really doesn't come out on the map too much. In terms of like, even like, for example, if you have public policy conversations, or if you check, for example, the cabinet speeches, China does not come up in most, like, you know, in most cases. It's only recently, and I mean like last year, last two years, that China has been being mentioned in cabinet level conversations, right, about, you know, to, like, infrastructure and building and that kind of stuff. But on the ground level, Honestly, people don't think about China. I guess I'm a little surprised to hear that because the Caribbean consumes quite a bit of American media and American news. Mm -hmm. And given the fact that China is seen so negatively in the United States, I would have thought that some of that negativity would have kind of crept over into the Caribbean through American media. See, the, uh, the Caribbean also has a very negative view of America also. Oh, interesting. Okay, well, that does make sense. Uh, you, you, let's close our, our conversation on the virus. The, the Chinese have been very ambitious around the world, promoting what some people call vaccine diplomacy. The Chinese are, are going to have this huge initiative going underway now throughout much of the global south to donate, sell. We don't quite know what the financial arrangement is on the distribution of these vaccines. In the Caribbean, what are they doing in the vaccine front? Guyana had received some vaccines from China a couple weeks ago, but I think about 20,000. Obviously, you mentioned Dominica kind of having this China relationship as, as well. But, and then Jamaica has been trying to reach out to China to actually get some vaccines as well. But I don't think the vaccine uh, soft power from China has actually pervaded the Caribbean that much as yet. And I'm not sure why that is. You do have some examples in Guyana, they got, I think, 20k vaccines from China. You mentioned Dominica also getting some from COVAX, but they're signaling out China as a source. But then you have, like in Barbados, the vaccines that Barbados have recently, they got 100,000 doses from India, which is, you know, pretty surprising. That's not actual partner that Barbados has ever actually had. I haven't actually heard much about the China side of the vaccine uh, from Barbados. And then from the other Caribbean countries as well, they've not been saying that much about China in terms of vaccines. So it's actually surprising how little relative information and little relative presence that China has been bringing to the Caribbean in, on the vaccine front. You know, listening to all of your comments over the past half hour in this discussion, I, I'm more confused than how I started the conversation, <laughs> which is actually a good thing. And this is one of the things I always say when I give China Africa talks is that I want to leave people more confused than when we started because the relationship is not as binary as many people think it is. Mm -hmm. The good and the bad sit side by side with one another. That seems like the case also in the Caribbean as well. But it feels like in many ways the Caribbean is still in the minor leagues. Oh, it yeah. is still not you know, a, a major you know, region for the Chinese, though they are there. The Americans are very concerned about the presence of the Chinese in the Western Hemisphere. But that being said, the, the Chinese engagement overall feels quite minimal. How would you kind of describe the Chinese relationship in the Caribbean today and going forward? I think one thing to keep in mind is that the Caribbean is not a blob when it comes to geopolitics. It's a very heterogeneous region, and China does also treat it that way too. So in Barbados, as an example, China doesn't have any large projects going on. There's one hotel being built on the south coast of the country that is not that, you know, in everyone's mind. 
But at the same time, there is something called the Fish and Dragon Festival in Barbados, which is actually a cultural festival that blends Chinese culture and Barbadian culture. And that's not actually present in, in other, other Caribbean countries. But then you have, for example, in Guyana, where there are many uh, various um, projects being built by Chinese firms also in Trinidad. But Trinidad also has a very large Chinese population, you know, na- na- natively. Jamaica as well. I think 5% of Jamaica population is ethnically Chinese, from heritage-wise. So also the engagement in Jamaica is quite substantial. For example, the America's headquarters for China Harbor is in Kingston, Jamaica. And from there, they do all the other Caribbean projects. So the so what people think about China there, how China actually operates there is very different than it operates in Barbados, which again is very different from how it operates in Guyana and also Belize, you know, so on and so on. So I think that in Caribbean approach to China, although the the diplomatic relations has been quite old since the 1970s, it's only actually now gets to a point in the last decade where you actually start to see more actual bi-directional engagement. So I think in the next decade to come, you're going to see a lot more Chinese projects. You'll see a lot more Chinese presence in, 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 in the Caribbean. I think the Caribbean is going to go aside with China a lot more multilateral issues than it would have otherwise. Because this decade has really been a very raucous period in terms of the engagement that China has been doing in the Caribbean. And because there's, a, there's something, it seems to be a, a newer realization in Caribbean that there's kind of been left behind by North America, particularly the USA and the UK. And I think one of, another, to give an example, last year Barbados announced that they are becoming a republic. They're therefore they're dropping the Queen of England from head of state. And when they did that, the government in England said, and I am, I'm very serious, they said, Oh, it's because China's influence on Barbados <laughs> is making them drop our queen as the head of state. Oh, my Lord. No, when that happened, it was this realization that they don't know anything about wow. Barbados anymore. And it's very clear that they are no longer fit to be good partners. That's incredible. So I think because of these things, you're going to see a lot more in- engagement with China. I don't think it will be as sophisticated as it, as it should be, but you will see a lot more of it. Well, it's a lot like when China first went to Africa in the early 2000s, 2003, 2004. Those were the, the first green shoots, and it didn't look like it was going to be a lot then, but boy, here we mm-hmm. are now, 15 years later, 16 years later, and Africa is a very important part of China's foreign policy matrix. The Caribbean looks like it is potentially on that same trajectory. And if you want to find out what is happening in the Caribbean with the Chinese, there's really only one source to do that. And that is the China in the Caribbean podcast hosted by Rashid Griffith. Uh, it's really a fantastic show. You, you've, you've just started it about, what, three, four months ago? That's right. And how many episodes do you have so far? I think 13. Fantastic. And it's a great show. I've listened to every single show, every single episode. I can't recommend it enough. And really what it does is it really helps round out your diet of China watching that you break away from the U.S.-China, U.S.-European-China kind of dynamic and to see what China's doing in the global south. Obviously, if you're listening to this show, it's a topic that interests you. And I would recommend you check out uh, Rashid. Where can people find the podcast and also find you on Twitter. So you can find me on Twitter at Rashi Wu. That's R A S H E E D G U O. And then you can find the podcast everywhere you typically find podcasts. <laughs> yeah, just search for China in the Caribbean podcast. I'll put links to the podcast as well as to Rashid's Twitter account in the show notes as well. Uh, Rashid is a subscriber to our daily email newsletter. One of the things that I've been doing uh, with Rashid, who's helped me a lot with his Twitter feed, is I've been adding in more Caribbean news into the daily newsletter that I produce along with Cobus. But I do want to uh, thank you, Rashid, for subscribing to the newsletter. The newsletter is a, is a labor of love for what I do every day, and it really summarizes all the different things that are going on in the China-Africa relationship, but increasingly what China's doing in places like the Caribbean, the Persian Gulf, the Central Asia, and throughout the global south as well. Subscriptions start at just $7 a month. 
And if you use the promo code podcast, we'll give you 30% off lifetime subscription. So year after year, you'll get 30% off. Just go to ChinaAfricaProject.com slash subscribe, enter the promo code podcast, and you'll get that discount. So for Kobus van Staden, who unfortunately can't be with us uh, to say goodbye, I'm Eric Olander. Both of us will be back again next week with another edition of the China in Africa podcast. Thank you so much for listening. The discussion continues online. Head over to facebook.com slash China Africa Project to share your thoughts on today's show. Or follow the guys on Twitter. Eric's at Iolanda, and you can find Kobas at Stadenesk. For more information about the China Africa Project and to sign up for our free weekly email news brief, go to chinaafricaproject.com. <laughs>